We're, we're grateful for the power of electronics today that we're able to pull Veronica out of our archives and uh, hear from her. And uh, Veronica, if you do see this, we are definitely praying for you and uh, um, praying for you, you and as long as so many others right now. What now? That's the sermon title today. What now? And it's a question I asked of my teacher many years ago. I was in high school, and one of my math teachers, my senior year, uh, gave me a personal challenge. I guess he thought I needed to uh, move beyond what we were doing in class, and he gave me something to challenge me. Now, if you remember anything about your math, you should remember that graphing takes place on two axes. Remember that? Now, so, okay, uh, let me pause for a moment. There'll be a test at the end. Uh, okay, so, uh, you ready? Okay, so, graphing takes place on, on two axes. You have an x-axis and a y-axis. Your x-axis, the horizontal, your y, the vertical. And let's say you wanted to plot the point two, three. What would you do? You'd count over two spaces on the x-axis and go up three on the y-axis, and it would be approximately in that, in that location. And you can take uh, through that point, you can draw a line, and that line represents a linear equation. Uh, you know, you could mathematically determine the, uh, you'd have to have a few more dots and things on the uh, on there, but you could find two points on that line, determine the equation, and that line represents every pair of solutions to that uh, equation. Now, I say that because my teacher asked me to, Mr. Brinker with his name, he asked me to investigate graphing on parallel axes. Now, you won't find this in any math textbook that I've ever seen, um, and um, uh, it was something brand new that I had not even thought about. And so with that, if you wanted to graph, for instance, I'm not sure what our next thing is, but go and bring the next slide up, Mike. Okay, so uh, those axes, that line there would represent zero, zero, because it goes through the zero point of each of the axes. So uh, that point is represented by a line. If we wanted to graph the same point two, three, we would put the two on the x-axis, the three on the y-axis, and then you would draw a line through it. Now that's what he showed me. Uh, that's what he showed me. Uh, and so my question was, what next? What now? And his answer to me was, you tell me, basically. He said, I want you to investigate graphing on parallel axes. How would a line graph? How would a, uh, a quadratic equation that's a, para a parabolic shape, a parabola, how would that graph on parallel axes? And so I, I set about, I had no other information than what I just gave you. And he wanted me to investigate what would happen uh, with that. And so, you know, lines, parabolas, higher powered equations. And so he left that to me. Uh, now, if you want to go further into that and you want to sit down and, and, and find out what I learned about graphing on parallel axes, uh, I, 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 can, I can do that if you want a challenge and a mental challenge uh, on that. Most of you said, uh, you know. <laughs> okay, there's a purpose for that. Because my question was, what now? What next? And I was left with just the challenge of investigating that to find out what would be next and where I would go from there. That leads us to a scripture for today. 
Jesus had given final instructions to his disciple. And then they had to face that what next or what now question. For me, it was a question, you know, my mind was uh, running through all kinds of things. What would this look like? And so I, you know, I began to, uh, on paper and draw and things like that. But theirs was not a, a mathematical question. Theirs was a life question. And what would be next? The disciples had gathered with Jesus on the, on the hill, the Mount of Olives, outside of Jerusalem. He gave them some instructions, which included Acts 1.8, where he had told them they would receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit comes on them and they would be witnesses to him in Judea and Samaria, uh, and Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, all around the world. Uh, and so after that, he rose. He left. They stood on the mountain as he ascended into heaven. So in that same chapter, first chapter of Acts, this is what we read next. It says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, angels. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up in the, in the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So there the disciples were, standing on top of the Mount, Mount of Olives. They had watched him ascend, and they were kind of, you know, still kind of gazing up in the sky. What's going on? What's going on? What were they feeling at that time? You know, as I, as I began to, to uh, think about this and think through this, my, my mind runs through, it's kind of like as I was doing with the, uh, um, the graphing. My mind would run through what, 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 what if, what if, what if, what if. But what if, what were they thinking? The disciples, they stood there, their mouths open, looking up into the sky, and suddenly there's two angels standing beside them. So let's think about that. The angel said to them, basically, don't just stand there. <laughs> don't just stand there. You know, what are you doing just standing around looking up into the sky? He says, why are you doing that? And they say, you know, remember, he's going to come back. He left you like this, but he's going to come back. In the meantime, you're not going to stand here on the top of the Mount of Olives gazing into the sky for the rest of your lives. You're not going to stand here just, just mouth open, wondering but you've got something ahead. But in the meantime, as they stood there, they were in awe. They were, I mean, put yourself there. Think of yourself on that hill outside of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives. You're with Jesus. And think about what you would be experience, experiencing at that time. You have just seen your friend your Lord, your Savior, rise and just float up into the clouds and disappear in the heavens. Now, that's not an everyday occurrence. I've never seen that happen, not without some kind of trick, uh, you know, movie photography. And, and uh, uh, I've never seen all of that. They didn't have all of that, and there were no helicopters or planes or anything else to take him up. He just, you know, I can just kind of see it, you know, and 
uh, you know, pictures having his, his arms stand out. I, I don't know what posture he's in. We have no idea what posture he was in. He just, you know, maybe he was waving as he went up. I don't know. But uh, uh, he disappeared from their sight. Now, they had seen many things over the last three years. People had been healed. Blind could see. Invalids could walk that couldn't walk before. Deaf people could hear. Even some who were dead had been given life. They had seen water that had been turned into wine, food that was multiplied for the crowds. They saw Jesus walking on the surface of the water in the middle of a storm. And he commanded the seas to stop, to settle down, the storm to stop, and so on and so on. All these three years, they had been with him. And all they had witnessed was truly amazing. But this had to top them all in, in one sense. I mean, like I said, there were no mechanical devices. Uh, and there was nothing to lift him up. Uh, no cinematography to, to make them appear like it was happening. It was live, life action. The disciples were amazed. And so they gazed up into the sky, looking after him until he disappeared. And, and evidently kept looking that way, kind of scratching their heads. There's a saying I've heard goes something like this. Some people are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. Now the angel told them, yeah, he's going to come back. But the angel didn't say to sit here, stand here, and just gaze into heaven. But some people get so focused on the return of Christ that they do very little in the ministry of God in this world now. And, and don't get me wrong. I believe strongly that Jesus is going to return because it, we're told it. He told us. He left that message. I'll be back. I will return. We need to be aware of it. We need to be ready for it. But that should not be an, uh, a reason for us to stand around and just wait. It should be an impetus for us to get his work done. Remember the opening scripture I read at the beginning uh, in John 9, 4, where Jesus said to his disciples, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when, when no one can work. You know, we are limited to the amount of time that God has given to us on earth. We have so much time to accomplish the mission that he lays before us, and we have no more. That day will come for each of us, as it has for others in our, our recent past. That day will come when time is up for us as, in, as individuals on this earth. Our lives will end someday. And, and for us collectively, Jesus will return. And all opportunities for ministry on earth will be gone. And so the disciples stood there just gazing up in awe. And I think it was more than awe too. It was an element of shock. They were shocked. There had to be some kind of shock. As I said, they spent nearly three years following him. They had given up their lives for his cause. He had died, which was devastating, but then he rose, and they were elated by that. And suddenly, he was gone again. He was gone again. Yeah, he would return at some some date later, time to be determined, you know, one of those to be determined type things on the schedule. But it was a very indefinite and a nebulous type of thing. When's he going to return? How long will he be gone? 
you know, uh, is he coming back tomorrow? Next year? Ten years from now? When will he be back? They had felt secure with him. So many things have had, had happened. They'd experienced with him his protection from in different instances. But now that he was gone, that question was there. What were they going to do without him? What next? What now? would they do? It was like the teacher left me alone with the project. <coughs> Excuse me. He didn't give me any other instruction. And he didn't want me to bring to him my results. And so I did that. <coughs> and that's the way they were. They did not have a guide and a teacher there who was going to lead them in the physical form step by step. Or so, or so at least they thought. He was gone. He was gone. And for how long? They had no idea. And now we know it's been a while. It's been a while. Okay? And so... They were confused and lost. I believe we can safely say that. They were confused and lost. Asking that question, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And how do we even know exactly what details, what to do step by step? You know, Jesus had given them many instructions. He showed them lots of examples. And on many occasions in his teaching and how he lived and how he acted, uh, he had showed them many times uh, through, through his life and through the, that three years. And so just, you know, basic questions. How could they even remember all that he had taught? How could they remember everything he had showed them, all the events and everything just in this instance, I'm sure, was just kind of running together in, in their minds. They had expected him to come back and to be the Messiah who was going to live on and, and, and carry out and, and bring freedom to their nation and bring freedom to them. And, 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 and he was gone. Their minds, I'm sure, were in a whirl. They didn't even have anybody to ask questions to, of. There was nobody else. Nobody else knew what was going on. They could simply look at each other and scratch their heads and, and no one could give them answers. Jesus had just told them before he left that they would be witnesses throughout the world. And that just added to the confusion and the lostness. How could they accomplish a task so great? How could they, how could they be about that business and how could they do all of that. God gives us tasks that are beyond us. He gives us things to stretch us spiritually and mentally and physically and every, every other way. He gives us tasks that are above us. And he does that intentionally. But as they looked at those tasks, yeah, they heard uh, what Jesus said, but they felt powerless at that po point. They just felt powerless. Jesus had promised them power, and, and that's what they needed to remember, that Jesus had promised them power, but at that moment, that was just a, a statement. That was just something they heard. How could he fulfill that promise? Well, they had seen the power he demonstrated time after time after time as they, as they followed him. But how would they have any kind of such power in their lives? 
I mean, they can, they can look back in the recent past. When the pressure was on at the time of the crucifixion, they felt no power. They ran. They hid. They were like, they were cowards. Peter tried to hide in the, in the crowd. And when he was recognized by uh, uh, even a little girl, he denied three times he even knew Jesus and even cursed it, cursed about it. If they couldn't handle the pressures at that time, when he was still there, and although it was a difficult time, how could they, how could they garner the power to accomplish anything for him? Where were they going to have that power? It seemed to be a hopeless situation. And here they were, just on the hill, looking up. If you're like me, you've had situations in life that seem to be hopeless. You can't see any way out. You can't see any way around. You can't, you don't know where to turn. You don't know what to do. Uh, you know, even you feel at times even God is not hearing you. He has abandoned you. The disciples were feeling that, that Jesus had left and they were abandoned. You know, we've been there several times. I'm sure you have too. I'm sure. With jobs lost or illness or, or death or whatever the occasion, whatever the situation. And so the question becomes, what do we do? What do we do? For the first time, since they had left their homes and the families, their occupations, the disciples were on their own. They were on their own. They were about to learn what Paul later wrote very simply. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul wrote, For we live by faith, not by sight. Jesus was going to be, he already was, he was out of their sight. Physically, he was gone. And so they were going to have to learn that we must live by faith and not by what we see. In the meantime, right there in that context, in the first chapter of Acts, Jesus had given them instructions. So let's look for a moment at those instructions that he gave to them. In, in verses 4 and 5 of, of Acts 1, he said, wait. Wait. He said, I want you to stay here in Jerusalem and, and, and wait. Now, waiting is not easy to do because we don't like to wait. You know, we, we go to Sean's Barbershop and there's three people ahead of us and we don't want to wait, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and by the way, you know, he does a good job. Um, he didn't even charge me a finder's fee like most of them do. Uh, but, uh, so. but uh, uh, if, if, if you guys need a haircut, see Sean. But anyhow... Um, waiting is difficult. We're impatient people and we want things immediately. Well, this is not the only time that believers, that followers of, uh, of Jesus, followers of God were told to wait. Way back in the Old Testament, Moses told the Israelites to wait at the bottom of Mount Sinai while he met with the Lord. So he went up the mountain, was gone like 40 days, and the people failed. They built an idol. They built a golden calf. You know, they sacrificed their, their gold and their jewelry and put it all and melted it down and made a golden calf, and that was their God. Moses is not coming back. God's not going to uh, come back. We'll just have our own God. We can see this God. 
And so they worshiped that golden calf because Moses was so long on returning. In the New Testament, Jesus left nine disciples to wait in town. While he took Peter, James, and John up the mountain, probably the same Mount of Olives, we're not sure, but probably there. He took Peter, James, and John up the mountain for, the, for what we call the transfiguration. So they had this wonderful experience on top of the mountain. And while they were gone, the nine that were left met a situation, a person who was demon-possessed. And as much as they tried and, and spoke to the demon and everything else, they couldn't cast the demon out. And so when Jesus came back down with the Peter, James, and John, when they came back down, they asked, they asked Jesus, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we cast him out? And we've seen you do it. Why couldn't we do something like that? And Jesus replied, you just don't have enough faith. You just haven't learned to have the faith that you're going to, to need and that they would need like going on now from his rising back to heaven, his ascension. After Saul, who later was known as Paul, we know him as, after he was converted, he spent time alone in the wilderness, studying and praying, waiting before he was ready to begin his ministry of traveling and preaching. He waited for the right time. He waited for the right time. We're gonna... But this time, as the disciples were on top of the Mount of Olives and Jesus had left, he had told them, go back in Jerusalem and wait. There's a time for waiting. That waiting may involve preparation like Paul, Saul in the wilderness with God speaking to him. It may be involve preparing us for the ministry he has for us. It may be a time of, of, of maturing before we're ready to take on some of the tasks that God has for us. And sometimes it's a process of waiting and doing at the same time. We have to wait sometimes. Sometimes we want to run away, run ahead of God and say, okay, God, I'm up here. Are you, gonna, are you following me? <laughs> no, that's not the way it works. We must wait sometimes. But waiting is not forever. The disciples were not going to have to wait in Jerusalem forever. There was a limit. People, some people, become believers 10, 15, 20 years later, they're kind of still waiting. I don't think that's what the, the Jesus meant. I know it wasn't what he meant, and it's not what he means for us. Waiting does have a limit. We're to wait at times, and, and, and that's sometimes more than once in life. You know, you, you, you wait and for God to give an answer and God to get some leadership and things like that. And so we have to wait. The disciples were told, before you do anything, your first action is to wait. Wait. And then you're going to know. You're going to know where you go from there. The next thing they did, they didn't simply spend their time in Jerusalem doing nothing. They were involved in a vital task, that of praying. They prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. What did they pray for? Well, First of all, that we're told in the scriptures, they prayed for a replacement for Judas, the one who had betrayed Jesus, and he had hanged himself. The scripture says they returned from the Mount of Olives, that location where Jesus ascended, and immediately entered into an upstairs room where they were meeting together, and they began to pray. Those present were the 11 that were remaining, the 11 disciples, apostles, women who were followers of Jesus, including Jesus' mother and, and his brothers. They had become believers by then. And, and others said the number was about 120 people. And so Peter led them to pray for Judas' replacement. 
and Matthias was chosen. That's one thing they prayed for. But I think they also prayed because they were lost, confused, as we said before. They prayed for guidance. They prayed for direction. They were going to be involved in some kind of brand new thing. Jesus had talked about the church. He was talking about something different than what they had known. What would it be like? How would they establish it? What would they go about doing this? It's something brand new. It's like me graphing a parallel axis. How would I go about that? It's, it didn't make sense at first. And it's not something that, you know, in that case, that I'm going to use. But it was interesting to do. But I believe that they were in a situation like that. They needed guidance. They prayed for guidance. How would they even know they were on the right track? And I believe they also prayed for the power that Jesus had promised. He said, you will be receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, into you. And, and that was a mystery also to them. How would they be empowered? What would it be like? You know, what would it, how would they experience? How would they know when they received the power? How would that power affect their lives and their ministries? So they were there, waiting and praying. And then came the time to receive. Came time to receive. When we read all of Acts 4 and 5, I referred to a while ago, verses 4 and 5 of Acts 1, Jesus did tell them the source of the power. He said they would receive the gift the Father had promised to them. Uh, Jesus had talked about this, especially in John uh, he talked several times about the Holy Spirit that would be given. But Jesus said they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the next chapter, as the 120 were together unified in prayer. On that day, the power was demonstrated. Pentecost was a time when Jews traveled. It was one of the big, big occasions where Jews traveled from all around the known world. They came back to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And God chose that day specifically. I believe that's the reason he chose it, because there were visitors and from all over uh, in Jerusalem. He chose that day to reveal himself, to reveal his power, to reveal his Savior to much of the world they were going to carry their newfound faith to their home countries. And that would begin. Jesus said, you're going to be witnesses around the world. That was a beginning right there that day because they would carry that. There was no question how they would know they would re had received the Holy Spirit once it happened and how they received the accompanying power of God. What a sight that must have been. The Holy Spirit descending like flames on each of them, uh, you know, like a, a candle flame or, you know, you can imagine how you would. It just says tongues of fire. We don't know what that exactly means. I picture it like a candle flame. I don't know. But it's, uh, they were, uh, it wasn't real fire that was going to burn them. It was real fire of God that would inflame them inside in that sense. But they began immediately to share the message of Jesus. And they came out of the, uh, you know, there was a sound of a, of a rushing wind with it. Like a, it didn't say there was a wind. It said the sound of a wind. And so this sound that nobody could feel anything. And, you know, it's like a, uh, there's a train in the distance going by. They could hear the sound, but they couldn't see anything. The disciples saw the, the, the flames. And evidently they came out of the upper room. People were coming uh, to where they were. And they began the miracle of, of sharing the message of Jesus with Jews in each person's native language. Some say it was a miracle of, of, of speaking to, of the, to the believers. I mean, the, a miracle in the believers of speaking the languages. And other people believe it was a, a miracle of hearing. The people, it was kind of in the process translated like the universal translators on Star Trek. You know, they would, they would hear it in their language. But uh, uh, we're not sure how the, it was, but it was God's miracle of communicating the gospel. 
And it was the beginning of showing them how they would be used to carry his witness and how the power of God would lead them in establishing the church. That same power of the early believers is the power we receive when we become believers. The power is not reserved only for New Testament times. That manifestation of the power through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which occurs when we accept Christ as Savior, is not cookie-cutter fashion. God works in our, our lives differently in many different in, in, uh, fashions. And through His Spirit, He empowers us. He gifts us with, with His Spirit. He, he f- creates in us the, the fruit of the Spirit. It's how He lives through us. And he has for each one of us. The final thing they did was to act. It goes back to the angels on the mountain say, what are you doing just standing here? You've got to act. That action started with the waiting and, and praying and receiving. And now it was time to act. An old comical saying says, don't just sit there, do something. Don't just stand there, do something. The disciples could say, we've been waiting, we've been praying, we've gone through God's preparation. Now we are ready. They had to act, waiting, praying, receiving. They were involved in a new thing. They had known the synagogue and the temple of the Old Testament, but Jesus came bringing a, a new covenant It would entail a new body, a new concept. The synagogue and temple had grown to be solely for the purpose of gathering and worship for the Jews alone. Those are important, but there was no thought of reaching out beyond themselves to the Gentiles. That new entity, the church, which was also to be a gathering place of people and to give place a time for worship, had the very important added task of of reaching, of going into the world. You shall be my witnesses, he said. It was a learning process for the believers. At the beginning, their mindset was still to reach those in Jerusalem and Judea, the Jews alone. As God's chosen people, they believed that they were both the source of the Messiah and the sole recipients of God's grace. God had to show them that the gospel was for Gentiles and even for their hated Samaritans. It was not an easy lesson to learn. And the early church had to meet and discuss and sort the whole thing out before they understood there was more to it than just themselves. You know, it's interesting that God had to convince Peter even to go to the home of Cornelius, a Gentile, he spoke to him in a vision and showed him. He said, yeah, go into the Gentiles' home. The salvation is for them. God had to show Peter. Then Peter had to come back and convince the church and said, hey, Gentiles can be saved too. And Philip, under his ministry, went into Samaria and he had to come back. And they, In fact, they sent a delegation. They're, they're accepting Christ in Samaria. Where? They sent a delegation, the early church, to say, oh, I guess they can. I guess they can, but the church is there. So let's close this out, bring it down just to us for a minute or two here. We must intentionally act. We must decide to do so. You know, Jesus, when he made a statement implied that very directly. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. In Matthew 7, 7. To do the work of God, we have to ask. We have to ask questions like, what is your will? Where would you have me to serve? What would you have me to do? What gift or gifts have you given me to aid me in carrying out the work you have for me? We have to ask. We have to seek an intentional act. We must actively seek the path God has for us. We can't do that standing on top of the mountain, looking up at the heaven and saying, are you going to come back today? No. We must move. We must ask God for direction. We must move in the direction we understand it as well. We might move in the wrong direction. That's okay. 
God will let us know. Or we might be a few degrees just off, and, and God can adjust that as we move and, and she puts light on the perfect path. We'll never be perfect, but we're following his lead. Is it bad to try something and, and fail? Well, actually, no. In fact, we're not failures. We learn more from our failures sometimes than from our success. But the only way we can really fail is by standing on the mountain looking up in the sky doing nothing. That's the only way to fail. The third instruction Jesus gave in that verse was to knock. When we do, the door will be opened, he said. Knocking is more aggressive than seeking. We seek opportunity. We do things and we actually walk through the door and God opens the door. And, and we must walk through. God provides. And we have to act. We have an opportunity coming up October 14th to reach out to our community. We've hosted something in the past, the meeting Tuesday night. We're going to do some planning if you can come at our house. And, uh, you know, that's up to you. But we'd like to anybody that wants to come and have a say so as we put that together on there. As I said earlier, the other table, the back sheet, uh, a sign up sheet on the back table back there if you want to sign up even now community giveaway, bring things. You can help in so many ways. You can bring things for that. You can help with setup, distribution of, of giveaways. You can help with promotion. You can help with registration, help with games, help with food, help with cooking, serving, help monitor the jumping balloon, greet and meet people as they come. Talk with people. Invite them to church and share the gospel message. That, for some, is totally frightening. But we're going to be... Air- offering some training between now and then just to help you overcome that fear. And we'll let you know a schedule for us. So what now? We want to make sure that we're in the will of God, that we're waiting, but we don't wait forever. We pray for the guidance of God. We rely on the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And then we act. That's what God has called us to do. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. Lord, we give you thanks because you're God. We give you praise as God of the universe. And Lord, help us not to, help us, Lord, to to understand and know and have faith in the fact that you're returning. But Lord, help that to be the driving force that drives us to know that we have a limited amount of time that we must do your work, your kingdom's work. Give us that vision and help us, Father, to move forward in you, to move forward and do what needs to be done. Father, you are God. Instill within each of us your vision. Fill us each of us, with your spirit. Give to us, Father, your direction. We thank you. We praise you. And we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You that are online, we're glad you've joined us. And we invite you to join us next week during the week on Wednesday night. And God bless. God bless you all. We're glad you're here. And we'll see you around this week. God bless.